we, this is our last session of uh, the seminar uh, Social Movements and Political Action. It has been a very busy year. Uh, we have had uh, many sessions, uh, uh, all of them online since uh, uh, April uh, 2020. Uh, and this is our first other session, and so we, we are super happy to to have this, to start this new model, and that we hope it will continue in the next uh, semester. And to have uh, uh, with us, Kerman Calvo, for this first session, and I really thank you for, for being with us physically. Uh, it will be very nice. So, Tiago uh, Carvalho will introduce uh, Kerman in a few minutes, uh, just some few words about the seminar. It has been existing now for many years, for since 2000 and uh 14 and uh, so we have our uh, monthly sessions uh, we continue as i said before uh, online also during these pandemic times uh, with uh, different uh, guests uh, um, from different countries and discussing very different topics related to social movements and uh, political action in a very multidisciplinary uh, way uh, and we um, we will continue the next year, so we come back in September, and hopefully still uh, in this uh, hybrid uh, format uh, or uh, simply face to face. But I hope that we can continue in this format. But okay, enjoy the session. Now I give the uh, floor to Tiago, and after to Carmen. Hello, um, and hello those here and, and at home. First of all, welcome, Carmen to our uh, seminar. It is a pleasure to have you here, uh, as you know. Kerman has holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Texas. Um, he is currently a professor at the University of Salamanca, where he always holds the post of coordinator of uh, the unity of sexual diversity. I don't know if I'm translating this very well, but um, he, he, before he was at the Centro de Estudios Políticos y Constitucionales in Madrid, and also a research associate at the Human Rights Center at the University of Texas. His work, um, he works in social movements and protest uh, and, um, and pol uh, equality politics, uh, of gender equality politics and LGBTI and sociology of music. And I would like to highlight some publications that Kerman has had recently among, um, especially one that I think I would enjoy reading and that we've talked a lot called, I'll translate it from Spanish, Music in, in the Balconies, Resilience in Times of COVID. Uh, that will be published in the Revista Española de, de Investigaciones Sociológicas, but also other papers, uh, one that he presented recently here about the long shadow of activism, Podemos and the difficult choices of movement parties, uh, work with uh, Martin Portos on the same topic that he will present here as well. And um, I was looking for your book. Um, I can't find it, but you have a book also coming from your PhD thesis as well on um, the LG, LG, LGTI uh, movements in Spain. So thank you very much, Kerman. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, it really is to have a, such a good friend today presenting and the floor is yours. Okay. okay. Thanks so much, Tiago. Thanks so much, Guya. Uh, it, it's funny because uh, uh, Tiago, uh, brought this morning to me and said, can, can you give me a presentation of yourself? And I sent him a couple of lines and then he has built on that basic information to elaborate this lovely profile. Uh, that sounds probably too, too compelling. Uh, I am delighted, delighted to be here in Lisbon at the, at the, at the BCT in a scholar. And thanks so much for taking the effort of organizing this uh, last last seminar. In the, in the, I understand that this is very difficult timing, but well, the good thing of hybrid sessions is that they are recorded so someone you know can listen online or perhaps people will listen to it later so uh, I am happy to get perhaps questions or reactions at the later stage perhaps I will have to get used to this continuous process of learning that things take place at the, at a, at in the room but perhaps a week later no so I'm I'm, I'm very pleased and I'm, I'm very happy with these new new formats uh, I wanted to say that I'm going to be talking today about a topic that I am passionate about, which is 
uh, the repression of, of the anti-austerity mobilization. And I'm going to be talking about somehow the combination of two papers that I am finishing up. And one of them has been written uh, with Aitor Romeo. I think he is in the room. So I, yes, I, I wanted to acknowledge his, his involvement and participation in, the, in this work. And the other paper is with a colleague uh, of mine from the Universidad de Extremadura called Juan. Juan Garcia. So uh, somehow uh, uh, this, this thinking of mind about repression somehow uh, perhaps finishes a cycle of interest in the Movimiento 15M. This is a movement uh, that I was involved with at, at, at the early stages of, uh, of that movement. And I've published a couple of things in relation to the profiles of people uh, participated in it, etc. But uh, recently I've been more, more interested in the responses. In the, in the political responses uh, towards this cycle of mobilization you know, and, uh, and, and this big concern about, about repression. And repression is always a very difficult concept. So there are clean and cut categories, the clean cut categories in social movement research, and there are some concepts that are not very ambiguous and we are very happy with them, but repression is not, is not one of them. Uh, for very many reasons. We know that it is important. It is becoming more and more important as countries are getting very hostile to different forms of globalization. And, uh, but the concept in itself is, is fraught with, with difficulties. There are very many defi definitions in the literature, of course. I'm just using the most basic and perhaps the better known one by, by Charles Steele, any action by another group which raises the contenders' cost of collective action. And of course, repression was part of the very beginning of social movement theory, you know, as much as. Uh, people organizing wanted to uh, bring about changes in public policy. Uh, scholars were interested in the reactions, not in the things that political authorities, states, private actors did against these, uh, these new people uh, organizing unconventional. But it is a very difficult problem for very many reasons. Uh, some of them I will. Uh, some of them I will highlight in the presentation. And, uh, but you can imagine, firstly, that it's a very subjective term, very much like with violence. Uh, when you uh, talk about repression, particularly when you include the word repression in funding applications, for instance, it seems that you are taking sides. Of course, police authorities never accept that what they are doing is repression. No, repression seems to be laden with subjectivity, something that is bad, that you are curtailing the rights of associations. So in itself, it's a very difficult concept. It's a concept that actually is very difficult to generalize because there are so very many difficult, it's very difficult to make universal arguments about repression. It is based, it is conditioned by regime type, but all kinds of variables. Uh, I know this is a problem in this social sciences, but when it comes to repression, it's particularly pressing. It's very difficult to make a theory of repression because obviously the responses of states and political authorities in non-democratic countries have nothing to do with the responses in democratic countries. It varies is according to type of mobilization, etc. So it's it's very it's a very very difficult concept, and also the fact that our repression instruments are expanding. So the number and the types of means of repression is expanding in contemporary democracies is making the concept very difficult because we are putting inside the idea of repression two very many things: channeling, chan uh, channeling, regulation, coercion, extermination. So uh, well, quite quite perplexing at times. But most important, and one of the big, big problems with repression is that uh, we seem to be doing research on the visible. And sometimes, I mean, and I, I totally understand, and when I communicate this idea with my students or in other spaces, when we talk about repression, instantly we think about the police exerting force against the demonstrators. Totally fine. But of course, there are so very many cases of repression that are not visible, but we are just concentrating on the exercises of force. But what happens when with preemption? What happens when political authorities, social forces intervene in the capacity of social groups to mobilize? 
and I am particularly inclined, and I am particularly, uh, I, I appreciate particularly the work of Pamela Oliver, who in 2008 made this argument and tried to present what is going on in the United States in relation to mass incarceration and with racial issues as an example of repression. Well, the very fact that black minorities and black people are not protesting as much as they should is a clear example of repression because they are not given the basic opportunities, the basic opportunities to mobilize, to generate ideas, or to really to create the organizations, the networks or the platforms so that their rights can be advanced. You know, the very fact that the judicial system is biased against racial communities the very fact that prisons are full with black people are examples of repression, which is a totally different argument from this basic situation of a mass demonstration that is dealt violently with by, by the police. Now, so I would I, I, I just trying to, to insist on the on, on the fact that repression is a very uh, interesting topic, but perhaps it is so difficult. Uh, a lot of social movement scholars have been leaving it for a better day. And perhaps, well, because we wanted to understand the origins of social movements or the different types of mobilization, etc. But it hasn't had, the, it hasn't merited the sort of big attention uh, from the from from the scholarly research than other uh, other of other questions. There are things that we know, and there are things that we don't know about repression. So these are some of the things that that I know, and I want I don't want to be very extensive on, 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 on this theoretical review. We know that repression expresses itself in different ways. We know that all kinds of states, whether democratic or not, really seek to regulate and control protests. We do not really live in a world in which political authorities do not want to manipulate, control, and organize protests. We know that there are uh, contextual and political variables that help in repression, but in different ways. The lack of democracy, the weak separation between powers, a type of, of, of regime, the presence or absence of a strong conservative political party. So there are variables that when placed in statistical models will help to understand why perhaps a given country or a given time is more inclined towards, towards repression. We are also beginning to understand that repression is something that both public and private actors do. This is very important, it's very important to me. So it's not just a question of the police and the judiciary, but also perhaps the coalitions that can be set up to do repression, perhaps the media can help governments to repress. No, so uh, we are starting to understand that repression is not only a public thing; that there are coalitions between public and private actors that can have the same the same goal. Of course, and this is one of the big things in the literature of repression, that the style of policy matters, and there is plenty of literature in relationship to variations in the cycle and variations in police responses. So there is a, a lot of going on about the interaction between protest and, and repression. And we also know, and perhaps it's very simplistic, but important nonetheless, that not every form of protest reacts the same way to, to, to repression. But unfortunately, there is plenty that we do not know. Plenty that we do not know about repression. Uh, we don't really know, and perhaps it is quite surprising, but we do not really know what are the consequences of repression. The big thing. No, this is perhaps the most important thing. So uh, does repression work? Well, it really depends on so very many things. So the literature has found that sometimes it radicalizes movement, but sometimes uh, repression uh, pushes movements towards moderation. So there are disparate, there are not converging findings in the literature. So we do not really have a robust, strong theory about the consequences of repression and also Surprisingly enough, we do not have a very convincing theory about the causes of repression, of why the states repress, particularly in democracies. Perhaps the argument is very clear when it comes to non-democratic regimes. So it's not that difficult to come up with, um, you, you go to political science and then transitions towards democracy. So this literature that gives you convincing explanation of why and how non-democratic regimes approach 
dissent. But in democracies, exactly, no? Why exactly uh, conservative governments are so hard on some forms of protest, but not in relation to others, no? Exactly what explains the timing and the differences across countries in the scale and intensity of repression. This is a very important question, but sometimes uh, uh, takes us away from social movement research and forces us to do legal research of public policy analysis. And because of this uh, complexities, we do not have any strong answers to the question of why a particular government is so inclined towards repression. Towards, which is a very, a very, a very important, a very important question. What I do in my in my work is I'm trying to understand what is going on or what has been going on in the past ten years in relation to the Movimiento Quinceme and the anti-austerity cycle of mobilization. And I'm trying to uh, uh, to provide an answer based on the concept of penalization. This concept comes from the social, legal, and criminologist literatures. It's a, it's a concept, it's a very broad concept that this a literature uses to try to understand the different ways by which states can deal with social problems. The idea of penalization allows us to combine and to pay attention to different instruments of repression. It helps us to see that the responses of political authorities or political authorities plus private actors are very complex. They change and they combine different instruments. This particular concept was, tried, was, was part of a larger effort by critical criminologists to try to understand what's going on in relation to mass incarceration. Penalization is a concept that was developed and then used by Wakant and other kinds of sociologists to try to understand the different profiles of people being in jail in the United States and similar country. So what's going on? Why is it that judges are tougher on black people than on white people? Why is it that the chances of being in, in, in prison in the United States are so high if you are a young black man? So what's going on? So the penalization uh, connects with process of discourse, ideas, operations in the law, but also police activities that converge in transforming the general view of a given, of a given, of a given situation. So this is why I am using it. Instead of saying that the Movimiento Quinceme has been repressed, I prefer to say that the movement, that this uh, movement, this cycle of mobilization has been penalized. And, uh, and, and this allows me to pay attention to different instruments. And I argue, I argue that the penalization of this cycle of, of protest takes place, uh, has, been, has, uh, has been organized according to three instruments, which is a key by a certain use of policy, a certain approach to security sensation, and a, a, a certain approach to criminalization. So the three go together and they build up a technology of repression, if you, if you speak. So my first argument is that the anti-austerity cycle has been penalized. The second argument is that repression intentionally aims at the suppression of dissent. So it is not an accident. And perhaps you think, what? Wow, what well, he's so clever. But the thing is that when you pay attention to certain uh, literatures, particularly social legal studies, they tend to believe that sometimes a state react by inertia, automatically. So the very fact that you have a large police forces you to use it as soon as people gather in the streets. No, so it's, it, uh, there are so very many criminologists and social legal scholars that would say, well, the very fact that the government displays large police forces before a demonstration, it doesn't necessarily mean that they hate protests. It's the fact that, well, uh, we have a certain regulations in place, we have a big budget for the police and the police needs to be used. So it's an open mechanical operation in, in, the, in the legal infrastructure of the city, no? But I really, I really think that uh, our repression intentionally aims at suppressing dissent. So in democracies, in democracies, uh, uh, a penalization works as a dissent suppressing mechanism. And I uh, lastly argue that penalization builds on certain features of the country. And this is very important to me. It's not uh, something that comes out of the blue. The very fact that 
the cycle in Spain has been so heavily penalized connects with a tradition in relation to legislation, in tradition, and certain features of political, county, uh, political culture of the country. The fact that we come from a dictator, see, a number of features that I will try to summarize later, summarize later on. So there is a connection between penalization, the responses to the cycle of protest, and some features, institutional, cultural, political, of the country. So if you want, it's connected to the structure of political opportunities. There is an opportunity in Spain to do penalization, perhaps an opportunity that is not present, is not present in other countries. So these are uh, the big, the, my big arguments here. I, uh, oops. I really do not want, uh, I, I really do not want to sound very apologetic, but I, I think that we have to make a brief commentary on the problem of data when it comes to repression. Data is a problem in all the social sciences, and of course it's a problem. It is a problem when it comes to social movements and globalization. But it is particularly a problem when it comes to repression, because sometimes not even a very large team can really gather all the necessary information that compensates the absence of official data. When it comes to repression, penalization, if you want, we have to collect data on people imprisoned, but people surveilled, people intimidated, people threatened. If you, if you, if you imagine, that's very difficult to collect. Perhaps you, you can use official statistics to, to, to find out how many people were sent to jail. Perhaps there are statistics about fines, about people even sent uh, to hospitals after demonstrations. But these other dimensions of repression people feeling intimidated. Well, this, this is data that really doesn't exist, that perhaps even the state doesn't have, no? So uh, sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's difficult really to, to, to find out a consistent and solid data on repression. Uh, what I, we are doing here is not based on surveys or hard quantitative data, but we've tried to gather different types of qualitative data to try to support our, our arguments. So uh, we've run a number of interviews with activists that were fined and had violent encounters with the police, and we've reviewed all kinds of reports, and we've done an extensive search in the media uh, to try to piece together uh, uh, examples of episodic information that all together we think adapt to the idea that the cycle of protest has been heavily penalized. But of course, there are not clear statistics. It's very difficult to say. Sometimes uh, how many people were detained or how many people were uh, injured in a given demonstration, because this is data that not even, not even the government. We tried, actually, we got rumors that uh, the police had some information about people detained on reasons or until sanity. We, we, a police officer told us that she thought that the police had this information, but we tried our best. Uh, we contacted a number of people that we knew they were working in the police, but we haven't been successful. So if this data exists, we do not, we don't have it. But still, the, the general consensus by NGOs, by our interviewees, and by activists themselves is that the, the, the cycle has been heavily penalized and that the situation is getting, is getting worse as time goes by. But we shouldn't be surprised by the fact that this particular type of mobilization has been so heavily, heavily penalized. Because there is something about the Movimiento Quinceme and anti-austerity mobilization that challenges political authorities. And this is why I wanted to, to, to call this seminar uh, the repression of a counter-hegemonic mobilization in, in Spain. Uh, uh, 15 and mobilization uh, were very remarkable in a number of ways. We have experts about that in, in, the, in, the, in the room and perhaps in the online as well. So I will not insist on a number of features that are very well known, but still I want to highlight uh, two elements that are three elements that are very relevant. Movimiento Quinceme 10 years ago. Today is a very significant date. 20 years now after Genoa, almost 10 years after the Movimiento Quinceme. So we have 
uh, the benefit of insight to, to, to look back and to try to see what's going on. And, and in relation to Movimiento Quinceme, uh, it was very important the fact that they discovered age as an element for political analysis. So uh, Movimiento Quinceme, the fact that it was participated by young people and the fact that the particular generation was put under the spotlight to say, well, we are frustrated, something is not going right with us. Uh, activated age and the problem of generations as a political weapon in Spain. And this is in itself a very revolutionary argument, you know? I mean, when it comes to intergenerational cooperation, the fact that the system is so biased uh, towards the older cohorts, et cetera, uh, gave the Movimiento Quinceme a very different profile, that a movement that was challenging something very deeply, very basic uh, in the Spanish institutional, political, and economic architecture. Also, it was very relevant that this was a movement that started to go to talk again about grievances and material concerns. So uh, perhaps it was the definite, the definitive end of identity single issue politics. So it was not a, a form of mobilization that wanted to change in a particular public policy or a general creation of a new institution. It was a movement that started to talk again about material concerns, about social justice, you know, about, about inequalities, about the fact that the economy uh, was manipulated by banks, et cetera, not corruption. All these elements uh, uh, gave the Movimiento Quinceme this counter hegemonic look, you know, and perhaps it created the perception that this was a form of mobilization that threatened the status quo in a very, in a very obvious, in a very obvious way. It's always important to remember, and, and you know, if, if you are familiar with the work of Christina, Pleasure, and other important scholars, uh, democracy was very important in the mindsets and the discourse and the talk of the Movimiento Quinceme and subsequent anti mobile uh, anti-austerity mobilizations. But it's uh, quite important to remember as well that this first approach to democracy had little to do with the basic question of civil rights and liberties. When the Movimiento Quinceme started to talk about democracy, it started to talk about reinventing democracy, transversal issues, better relationships between politics and the economy. But they didn't think that it had to be concerned with the very basic issues of the freedom to peace. However, the Movimiento Quinceme uh, uh, wanted somehow retreated and retreated back to old understandings of democracy after 27th May 2011. So it was just a few days after the founding Quince uh, de Mayo mobilization. In that particular day, the police very violently uh, destroyed the camp in Barcelona. So Movimiento Quinceme, for those that perhaps you are not that familiar with this form of mobilization, was based on a number of camps in large and small cities in Spain and then in other, in other countries with, with different names. So, uh, in most countries, uh, the camps remained unmolested by the police with some exceptions, but Barcelona was a case in which the police for different reasons entered into the camp and destroyed the infrastructure and evicted everybody from Catalonia Square. No, actually there was a, a big win by the Barcelona Football Club and they needed the space to celebrate the trophy and the conservative regional government who had their own uh, regional police intervened and uh, destroyed this particular acampado. No? So uh, because of this incident, El Movimiento Quinceme started to think about democracy, not in terms of future uh, reinvention of democracy, but also in all terms of basic rights, freedoms, and, and, and liberties. As I said, uh, I organized my thinking uh, about penalization according to three dimensions, policy, securitization, and criminalization. And uh, my, uh, my, uh, our argument in relation to policy is that uh, uh, police forces in Spain have become tougher when it comes to the dealing of the cycle of, the cycle of protest. Uh, our argument is based on the interviews with the feelings 
uh, the, the, the narratives and discourses of the people that we've been interviewing, and, and I sometimes I include some some quotations in the in the slide. I, I, I do not I need to read them aloud, but we have a lot of questions, a lot of quotations uh, describing the, the the impression of the evolution of of, of policy in, in in the country, and this helps us connect what's going on in the country with this argument by Gilham and Oaks in relation to the models of police responses to, to, to crowds. Now, we think that in Spain, uh, they are really consolidating, we are consolidating this model of policing called strategic incapacitation. And I think there is plenty of indication to suggest that this model is firmly, firmly implemented firmly implemented in the, in, the, in the countries. We've seen that the technologies of control and regulation have been sharpened. We've identified and strengthening of police capabilities and also a higher attention to surveillance. You know? uh, the, the model of strategic incapacitation is, was meant or was a discovery of police forces after Seattle and break with the tradition of previous models based on negotiation and cooperation with protesters. So a strategic incapacitation is a model of policing that tries to combine the respect of human rights or to give protesters the basic right to be there with a proactive approach by the police to try to limit and somehow deactivate the possibilities of radical and disruptive forms of mobilization. Now we see that this is in place in Spain very clearly, and this is developing uh, uh, according to these three, three uh, ideas. Of course, well, to, 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 to give substance to this, to this argument, well, you, you have to, to try to, to find different types of, of evidence. However, we really think that uh, the police, in colloquial terms, has become tougher, more involved, more inclined in Spain to react violently against counter hegemonic forms of, of mobilization. I just give some, some examples uh, in relation to very well known protest events in the country, like the Rodea Congresso protest event uh, that was made by 1,350 riot policemen. So, I mean, to try to, if you know Lisbon, try to place yourself in the Sao Bento Palace, which is very close. Uh, it's very similar to our Congresso. So imagine the stairs in the Sao Bento Palace and imagine the 1,350 riot police. So this is an army, this is a legion you know, uh, of people protecting institutions. You know? And uh, uh, there were so very many scratches in 2013, some of them in Salamanca, in very many cities in in, in the state, uh, for instance, a very well-known feminist scratch in, in 2013, it meant that some, a few, a few uh, feminist activists uh, uh, tried to somehow uh, criticize a member of the Popular Party, and they gathered in the entrance of the main building of the Popular Party in Madrid. We are talking about something like 15, 20 to 25 activists that were trying to wait for the leaders of the Popular Party in their main building, and the police displayed something like 20 police vans. So it was a big, a one police van per activist. Uh, in 2014, uh, a number of protest events scaled down to the local level and not taking place only in Madrid and Barcelona, but in very many, very many cities such as Burgos, Valencia, etc. Uh, a well-known one was the Gagonal uh, protest. Gagonal, you don't need to know the, the details, but this is just a neighborhood in a, in a medium-sized town called Burgos. The whole thing uh, revolved around protest against a parking, very much like in Gassi parking in, in Istanbul, uh, this uh, led to hundreds of people detained, a constant presence of the police, etc. There is plenty of data that suggests that uh, Spanish authorities have invested heavily on police capabilities, and they are doing it despite COVID-19. So I just have some data for you there, but in general, the general picture is that Spain has always been investing heavily in the police, but is investing in police capabilities even in a more remarkable way. 
even in a more remarkable way. In 2013, perhaps you can remember that we suffered a horrendous crisis in Portugal, in Spain, but despite the horrible uh, budget cuts, uh, this was the increase, 1,780% increase in anti-riot equipment in 2013. So this is something that criminologists and, and social legal scholars know very well. The more there is a social crisis, the higher the investment in the police, in security forces and in prisons, and the space is just confirmation about that. 2015, 4 million euros investment in anti-riot anti gear, etc. So uh, it's not scaling down, but it's scaling up the investment in all kinds of police capabilities. And lastly, to confirm a change in approach of policing in Spain, there has been a massive investment, like investment like in London, for instance, on CCTV security cameras. And also, and there was something quite interesting that we found in, in our interviews. So, and this is so difficult to prove, and we have to be very, very uh, uh, cautious and very careful when uh, making these kind of arguments. But this argument about the blacklists, this is something that uh, came up often in our interviews. So, as, as, as I mentioned a minute ago, we've talked to a number of activists that had been exposed to violence and they were fined. So even though we contacted a lot of, uh, plenty of activists in different countries, in different cities of Spain, but we just wanted to find out the experiences of those that had been fined. So what they felt and, and the consequences of finding, and also uh, people who had experienced violence by the police in protest events. And funny enough, mostly in all interviews, these are uh, the activists started to talk about the blacklist and, and several of them started to talk about situations by which the state, the public administration somehow knew that they had been protesting. For instance, in a couple of interviews, uh, the guy said, well, I, I wanted to renew my passport and I was in the queue, it was my turn, I went to the window, I wanted to renew my passport and then the police woman there said, oh, you participated in that protest in Salamanca, didn't you? And then so this sort of narrative suggesting that there is some sort of a flow of information in public administration that helps security communities identify key activists. Of course, we do not have hard evidence about that. I'm just presenting these narratives that quite surprisingly came up very often in our interviews, in our interviews. So that was the first element in the penalization strategy in the country. However, repression is not just taking the form of the stronger and more muscular uh, policy approach. There is something with ideas, with discourse. And there is an effort and we, we've identified trends and advances in securitization, which is a very difficult word, to pronounce in English. Basically, what we are talking here is a discourse mechanism by which powerful actors frame an issue as a threat. Securitization is a concept that comes from terrorism and migration and has been applied uh, to try to understand hostile responses to illegal immigrants, etc. But very interestingly, it can travel to uh, debates about social, social movements. And we argue, and I argue, that this particular uh, penalization mechanism is taking place not just by the activities of the press, by the press, but also by the deeds of political authorities. When one analyzes the press, and this is another paper, but if one analyzes the conservative press, you can, you, you, you can identify that the discourse in relation to this cycle of protest is based on hostility. Uh, basically, and I, I, I'm going to summarize this argument very, very much, but if anyone is interested, we can elaborate later on. Uh, after studying something like two pieces of information in four conservative journals, we identified a number of discursive mechanisms that helped the conservative press to present the Movimiento Quinceme as a threat. Infantilization, pathology, animalization. So there are a number of discourse mechanisms that help create the impression that the Movimiento Quinceme was a threat that it was not a normal feature of a healthy democracy by which young people started to gather together, but 
On the contrary, it was an expression of a pathology, a threat. That's quite clear in the observation of the conservative media in Spain in relation to the pathological thing. Securitization is an interesting mechanism because it is connected with public policy. It's not something that happens without purpose. Normally, uh, uh, powerful actors, the authorities, the press, uh, they shape the perception of a given problem so that they can justify punitive action at a later stage. It's not just a question of saying, well, we think these immigrants are going to steal from us. You say that because you want to impose a transformation in the penal code so that illegal immigration is a crime. No, so, and this is what really happened in Spain. Uh, in 2012, 2013, the conservative media started to talk about the movement of Infeme as a threat. And in 2015, the conservative government of the Popular Party passed a new gag law that responded to the security threat invented by the media. So, as I said, I have plenty of information about that, but I am quite concerned about time, so I will leave it. Uh, like that now, but it is also important to, to insist that securitization is not something that the, is not only something that the media does. Political authorities can contribute to that. For instance, if you have some guy that has a violent encounter with the police in 2012, and then El Fiscal, the general, the public attorney, this, uh, claims and demands 80 years of imprisonment. So if you do this kind of operation, uh, before the, the courts, well, you are giving the impression that these guys are all terrorists, you know, that this is a big, a big problem. So there were all kinds of speeches and statements by police leaders, by the government officials, by suggesting, by suggesting that this form of uh, young people's involvement in politics was very, very, very threatening and dangerous. Police forces talked about the enemy constantly. There was a particular remarkable case in 2013 uh, when some young people occupied a high school in, in, in it was called uh, Primavera Valenciana. And uh, the police, the head of the police in Valencia, uh, justifies the very violent intervention of the police in this high school by presenting, by talking about the students as the enemy. So we do not give weapons to the enemy. They are our enemy. And they were high school kids demanding uh, educational, educational reform. There are plenty, as you can imagine, there are plenty of examples of, of, of statements written in the press that confirm the securitization attempt. Uh, just, I'm going to read a couple of them. A small crowd that does harm, much harm, idealized masses. The camp mobilization has been abducted by the Marxist left. And this very long, long quotation that summarizes the whole point. The Spanish Revolution, wow, man. A sort of hallucinogenic sangria gets you high to a far less degree than, you, the, than that utopic substance that is traded in TV shopping. Because behold how the indignant herd hits you suddenly with no blows involved. The screaming mob, the surfers of cows, the unruly kindergarteners, keen on sitting on the squares after a tantrum that has gone unpunished, and so and so. So you can imagine it's plenty. It's plenty of descriptions by conservative editorialists and opinion makers that converge in defining, in defining the movement as a threat. And the last element of penalization is criminalization. Criminalization is a politically inspired intervention in different fields of law with hopes of diminishing the likelihood of protest. When we talk about criminalization, we do it in the general sense of criminology. So it doesn't really refer only to criminal legislation, but it's an intervention in the law to transform previous interventions in penalization into something that can uh, be can be conducive even to fines or to imprisonment. No? So political inspired intervention, different fields of law with hopes of diminishing the likelihood of protest. Just to summarize uh, here, which is this is a very, very expanding field and, and difficult to, to bring it down to, to just one slide, but there are two uh, aspects of criminalization that are remarkable. Firstly, a reform of the criminal code in 2015, and secondly, the so-called gag law, 
ley orgánica de dentro del marco de protección de la seguridad ciudadana. This is security legislation, which is often called the ley mordaza de gag law. So in combination, in combination, these two reforms that were passed at the same time punished most of the innovations of the Movimiento Quincene. Either in the criminal code or either in the gag law, most of the innovations in terms of occupation and the sort of things that the Movimiento Quincene did were subject to hostility in, in penal legislation. No? So we saw before that it was tougher police intervention, the securitization, and finally, finally criminalization that culminates and gives uh, coherence, if you want, to the repressive effort against, against the anti anti austerity cycle, cycle of, of protest. In the particular case of Spain, Securitization and criminalization took a linear path. We are not claiming that this is going to happen that way in all the countries, but uh, the observation of the country suggests that, well, there was first intervention uh, in securitization, tougher policy that led to a reform in, the, in different types of legislation against, against protests. Criminalization in Spain is taking uh, both a, a, an individual and, in, uh, and a massive dimension. So sometimes, in some occasions, key individuals have been targeted, have been targeted. But most remarkably, the most important, perhaps, expression of criminalization is the employment of fines, bureau repression, or red tape repression, las multas, which has become a, a very, a very serious concern for the social movement sector in, in Spain. The combination of these two interventions in the law made that some uh, behaviors were removed from the typology of crimes. They were object just, uh, they were just subject to fining. They are less, uh, less severe in terms of the possibilities of going to jail, but at the same time, uh, the, 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 the state could have the, the chance, the possibility of finding behaviors without judicial uh, oversight, which is, which is a bit of, of, of a problem. No? So, policing, securitization, and criminalization. I just wanted to finish up the, the argument. Uh, Okay. I just wanted to uh, finish up the argument by, by connecting this approach to, to repression and this approach to penalization with some features of the country, some institutional, cultural uh, features of the country. We argue, I argue, that uh, the capacity, the state has the capacity and the inclination uh, for repression because we have a particular, a, a particular tradition. Spain had a very long non-democratic experience and suffered terrorism in a large scale. The combination of two, these two uh, elements are justified from the very beginning of our democracy, high investment in police, in police forces. And Spanish, uh, Spain suffers from a disproportionate size of police forces. So perhaps this is something that not so very many people know, but other than Russia, Spain is the country with the largest police sector. So the number of policemen per capita is the largest in Europe other than in Russia. So Mediterranean countries have a very high number of police member capita, Portugal, Italy, and Greece, but Spain is the country with the largest number of policemen per capita, and, we, and it has been sustained uh, over time. Spain has perhaps the toughest uh, criminal code in the continent, perhaps the toughest criminal code. So the number of uh, behaviors that are included in the criminal code and the length of sentencing uh, pre, uh, uh, allows uh, experts in criminal legislation to define the Spanish penal code as perhaps the toughest uh, in, in Europe. And Spain has a lot of people in jail. And I am saying now in 2020, because three or four or five years ago, it, has, it had a horrendous and very high uh, prison population. And still in 2020 and 2020, Spain very close to poor, uh, Portugal had a very, very large prison population, much higher than countries with the worst problem of crime. And this is always a connection that has to be made. 
We are talking about a country, a scale in this case, that really has no problem with crime. So the, 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 the crime rate is very, very low, but who has a lot of policemen and a lot of people in jail. And a tendency, you know, a tendency of judges to really to impose very long sentences for any kinds. So any kinds of behavior. And the last element of this, or the, the last feature of this, of this uh, a quick description of the country is that societal feelings of insecurity are very high. So Spaniards feel very insecure, despite the fact that our uh, criminal uh, uh, crime rate is very, is very uh, low. Just to finish out the presentation, uh, this is just some uh, data to confirm the point. It is a bit dated already, it's 2014, but here I just compared uh, Spain and the United Kingdom. And you can see that we seem to be as scared as people living in the United States, despite the fact that they do have a problem with crime and we do not. You know? So this opens up questions about penal populism, etc., that we cannot address now in full, but that helps understand why our political authorities find it so easy to invest in repression, no? invest it, uh, uh, in repression. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna be finishing now. Uh, uh, of course, there are questions to be made about the consequences of repression in relation to activists. And we are exploring this, this, this data now. We are finding that the perspective of finding the, the, the perception of tougher policy is actually changing the mindset of very many activists that feel threatened and perhaps they think that the right the risk of getting into participation is very high but well we will have to to wait a, a little longer to explain that part of the of the interviews so i think uh i'm so sorry if perhaps i've abused no, my, my my time not at all. but this is this is what i wanted to discuss with you in today's session Thank you, Cameron. I'll join you here so we can. So, yes, so first, maybe let's collect questions from the room, from everyone who is here. Okay. And then, if people at home could maybe write their questions in the chat. Yeah, we can try to, no, there are about six or, so, um, yeah, if, yeah, maybe, do you have questions here? So maybe let's start at home. Who at home has questions for us? Ah, Luca has one question. Let's see if you he... can I speak now? Yes. Okay. Thanks, Carmen, for this presentation. I I follow a lot like with uh, Spanish political and also Spanish social movements. I have a lot of interest in this. I have like one very simple question is like, do you think that with the change of the government uh, change the relations with the political force and the social movements? And another question that's like connected with this one, uh, it's about the Ley de la Mordaza. Do you think that the new, not so new now government I don't know, it's not clear for me the position of this government in relation to the Lady de la Bordaza. They are against him, they are in favor of that. Uh, I think it is it, thank you. Sorry, Luca, can, can you say, can, can you repeat the first question? Because we had a little problem with the, with the sound, so in the, just the first question. Ah, okay, okay. No, the first is that if you can, like if there are a kind of, change in the relation of the policy and the protest with the change of the government. If you can see like less or more repression or if it's like the same thing, uh, it's more about that. Thank you. 
Okay, th thanks, Lucas. Shall I? Yeah, go. go okay, that, that's these are very uh, thanks, Omar. Very very interesting questions. Uh, the, in relation to the gag law, uh, that's that's the big the big issue, isn't it? Obviously, the uh, the coalition government has different approaches to to it. Or the Socialist Party uh, has a nominal nominal opposition to the gag law, but doesn't believe so the, the, the opposition because we, well, one needs to remember that the previous security legislation was passed by a socialist government as well. So I really think that uh, to, to a great extent, the, the socialist part of the government would prefer to just to keep the, the, the gag law in operation and perhaps tinker with a couple of aspects in relation to the, the perhaps the quantity of fines and some details. So I don't think the socialist government is opposed. The socialist government has been responsible for the bulk of the security policies in the country in relation to terrorism. In relation, so it has been in power for so long. So they, they believe for some reason that the penal code is not enough that we need ad hoc security legislation. So they are convinced about this institutional response to security that is not enough and that they need they need this additional piece of legislation and unfortunately I, the pandemic is is affecting this calculation because the spanish government has used or tried to use this piece of legislation to impose quarantines and to so it was part of the security responses to the pandemic so perhaps if you're following uh, spanish politics you might know that we have now a big constitution constitutional mess and the constitutional tribunal is saying that most of the things the government did were illegal, etc. But this is another question. But the government, the socialist part of the government believes that they need this security legislation in relation to the pandemic, because the gag law is not only, in, it's, it's a very complex and very worrying piece of legislation because it mixes very things, very many things together. The gag law was defended by the popular party in relation to Islamic terrorism. And it's quite interesting when you follow up the debates, you see that the interior minister and most of the popular party officials didn't speak about protest, even though then the gag law included so very many specific details about the new protest events. So, but actually it's meant to, to give capabilities to the government to respond to security threats in relation to the environment, in relation to terrorism. So this is why I think it will remain, unfortunately. So there is a point being made about yes, already, uh, just, just uh, uh, finishing up, but I think it will remain. So the, the socialist government is postponing the debate. There, there are always more important things to address, apparently. So I think it's quite unlikely that during this government they will do anything about it. And the same applies to the first question, because uh, there is some interesting research in Spain comparing the approach of the big parties in relation to security legislation are surprisingly there are not big differences between the popular party and the PSOE. So both use security issues when they are weak in the polls. They both use penal populism to try to intervene in the electoral cycle. So I do not really see a massive change uh, in relation to, to protest, perhaps there are details. It's true that it's becoming very difficult to make to substantiate this argument because during the pandemic, there are the, the, the level of protest obviously is not the same. So we need some time. But I do not really have the feeling that the landscape has opened for protest all of a sudden, thanks to the change in, in government. So this is my personal impression. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much for the answer. Martin has a question. Uh, Hi, can you hear me properly? Ciao. Uh, so happy to see you, Herr Kerman, and happy to see you with friends from Miste. So I have two questions. Uh, the first one I think is pretty obvious, is that Spain is a country with a particular, let's say, multi-level opportunity structure, right? Um, especially thinking in broader terms, not only restricted to anti-austerity activism and anti-austerity protests. Think, for instance, of, of the relationship of repression and mobilization uh, in the Catalan case and uh, mobilizations around independence. Or these days with, uh, well, feminists and LGTB activists and so on. Um, how this, uh, let's say, multi-level uh, story 
plays in or kicks in? It's a bit of a follow-up questions on what you just said on that the, let's say, the two main parties don't differ so much in terms of policy historically. But this is so when they are the national level governments. What about when, you know, you have different uh, governments uh, playing in at the subnational level, and especially in contexts that you know well, such as the Basque Country or or Catalonia, uh, where you know much of the policing staff and the policing, let's say, um, policies uh, are devolved or are uh, uh, let's say uh, imposed on the part of autonomies. And the second question um, is. Well, maybe it's more a, a, a it's more a reflection, or I, I would like you to reflect upon, is about this this idea that you articulated on you know, uh, Spain, Spain. Uh, I mean, the, the relationship without with the anti-austerity protest and uh, securitization, and especially you emphasized uh, in the in the talk the the part on let's say the the, the most formal and visible. Uh, mechanisms of repression that, uh, needless to say, they happened. Um, the thing is that, to me, Spain is a bit of an outlier in the sense of uh, we had a country with a mass mobilization. We had a country where uh, actually um, radicalization didn't really happen. It was more of a media construct than an actual you know, change of uh, repertoires on the side of activists. And still, eventually, uh, sort of, uh, in part through institutionalization, maybe not so much about uh, thanks to, to, to radicalization, the cycle vanished. I wonder what this story could tell us from a comparative vantage point. You know, to what extent we observe these dynamics of, of criminalization and similar uh, mechanisms behind uh, repression in other cases where anti austerity protests unfolded. Okay. Uh, these are difficult questions coming from a friend, particularly the second. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the, the first, the first one uh, is, a, is a very, very interesting and, and very important issue, and, and it relates to this particular feature of the of the Spanish landscape that we well, we are a decentralized country, and it's important to, to bear in mind that some parts of this decentralization uh, organization has autonomy in relation to policy, but not all of them. So yeah, it's true. Uh, Martin has in mind the, the cases of the, of the Basque country and Catalonia mostly because they have autonomous police communities. However, other communities autonomous do not. So, but there is another a third level, which is uh, and the, mo the more unexplored one, which is municipalities. And why, why I'm talking about them? Because an, an, an aspect, I didn't have the time to mention that in the talk, but an, an, a, a contemporary expression of, of repression uh, uh, has to do with the intervention in civic, in civic regulations. Some local, uh, local councils, municipalities are using legislation that, that deals with the cleaning of squares and, 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 and convivencia civica, uh, for, a, for a better word, to try to repress and to find protesters. So they, for instance, they, they want to, this happened to the Quince M, they organized an acampada and they were not uh, punished because of the, using the criminal code or the gag law, but they were fined because they were not clean enough because they were, lift, they were leaving pamphlets or, or, or furniture or debris in the square, no? So they were fine because they were untidy, no? So it's true that this opens up a, a, a very complex discussion about how different uh, our local governments of different ideologies are using what they have at hand to participate in these circles of repression, no? And then it, it opens up an interesting questions of whether or not they are follow up national policy or whether or not they are inventing policy. Uh, something that we, something that I know for a fact in, the, in, in Castilla, for instance, uh, which is where I, where I live currently in Spain, is that activists set up very complex uh, games in relation to different uh, police forces. For instance, in Salamanca, they know that the local police in Salamanca is their enemy. 
local the Salamanca is in the small municipality run by the popular party. So they know that they will come after them and they will use all kinds of local regulations to try to either ban the demonstration or to try to find them. So they always go in support, they, they always call the national police who has a delegation in Salamanca as well to try to protect them. No, and then they, they say, well, the, to, to enforce the rights or to protect the rights. So there is this triangular relationship of the local police in Salamanca against protesters and the national police helping them. However, in Valladolid, who is run nowadays by the Socialist Party, Valladolid is also is very close to Salamanca and uh, is a bit larger, the, the game is a different one. The local police is sort of supportive of protesters because it, it is a left-wing uh, ayuntamiento, but the national police is normally very oppressive, if you want. No? So it's true that this opens up a, a very complex and ambitious empirical agenda to try to really to find out what's going on. And then if we go to the intermediate level, which is the Comunidades Autonomas, uh, as you know much better than I do, it mixes up with the problem of national identities. You know? How, how uh, 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 the, the autonomous, the regional Catalonian government is using the police against the cycle of mobilization. And we've seen very paradoxical examples of mixed responses, no? Uh, some members of the government uh, using the forces to try to impose order while other members of the regional government giving, supporting the radical forms of, of mobilization, no? So I think we have to, to, to make a more complex model to try to adapt with other factors that, try, that might shape the behavior of these regional governments that have powers in relation to policy, which is not the general case in the country. However, I do not have an, an, easy, an easy answer to the second question, Martin, because I, I, I really do not know. I mean, the problem with the repression and, and, and when it involves criminalization and these kind of mechanisms is that they... That they, they ask for a heavy empirical knowledge of the, of the country. So it's, it's, it's not enough really to, to have a superficial approach to countries. You, and, and I really do not have that. So uh, I'm so sorry to disappoint, but I, I, I'm not really sure that I can give you an answer of whether or not the Spanish case is, is different. Uh, it, what I know, for instance, in the Spanish case is very close to the Greek one, for instance. No? So all, all, all that we've seen very recently, a very tough expression of policy and intervention in penal legislation very recently, now that they have a conservative government in place, it seems that the Spanish case and the Greek case are so similar, no? a tradition of non democratic regimes, etc., that actually explodes into an approach of mobilization based on security. So I could say that Greece and Spain are very similar cases, but I, I don't really have a better answer in relation to other, other, other examples. Okay, thank you. The next is you, Martin. Lara. My, my feeling is that uh, uh, the consequences do not have to be looked at the at the consequences on those on the, on the cycle because at the end of the day if you want uh, penalization really kicked in when the cycle was already somehow going down but i think the obvious consequences for this penalization is the preemption or something similar in the future so I think that the system is giving us a message that there are acceptable forms of mobilization like pensioners. So there are some forms of mobilization that can find the space in the Spanish political community, a traditional LGTB mobilization looking for equal rights, pensioners peacefully gathering every Monday demanding better pensions, but that there is no room for something like what we had 10 years ago. So it's not that uh, we see these activists that they are reactive because uh, as I said, penalization started to really to, to become a very, very important thing 
2014, 15, 16, when the anti-mobilis, uh, anti-austerity uh, cycle somehow was already declining. For those that are still involved in this form of mobilization, our feeling is that repression is radicalizing them. There is an element, there is an additional element that has to be uh, factored in. If activists find a network of support, for instance, if they are connected with trade unions or they've set up uh, some sort of a safety box for fines, etc. So they are willing to keep on participating and they are even more militant. They are more, but in general, I think in general, uh, we'll, uh, let's see if we can find out the data to support that. My, my feeling is that is uh, preventing, preempting other people with similar problems to do something like that in the future. No, basically the system is sending a message like, but this is what is going to happen to you if you tried something as counter hegemonic like that in the near future. So this is why I wanted to, to mention Pamela Oliver because with repression, there are a lot of things that are very obvious but a lot of things that are not obvious, no? And sometimes, why is it that uh, poor people do not protest? Why is it that the unemployed do not? Why is it that all those communities who really are not privileged, why they are not mobilizing? Well, because they, there are so very many uh, uh, signs, no? And messages sent by the system that are telling them, do not even try. So very colloquially, but this, this would be my, my, my response to that. Oh, yeah. I don't know. No, it doesn't make sense. No. Okay. I found it to a tutor to ask my question to do to Vasquez and say yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. We uh, really, really enjoyed it. And uh, we are, these are very, very uh, sensitive topics to me. And this my background with a bit of stuff from the perspective of repression and so as you mentioned at the uh, actually today is on the special day in, in 10 days uh, 10 years which I give because it's 10 years from this uh, episode uh, 20 years exactly 20 years today from Genoa uh, G8 2021 uh, and uh, Actually, many uh, scholars, uh, human scholars of my generation, particularly in Italy, and uh, in the South, are uh, very interested in social movement studies. Therefore, one of the consequences of repression to be uh, increasing social movement studies <laughs> in, the, in the long term. So, and I still cannot talk very easy about uh, this thing without being very, very to me, nothing happened, but uh, I think uh, um, so the daughter was there. And, uh, and then my interest in social movement started that uh, started in a, in a, and it started from repression. Actually, my first interest started in this, doing this episode and started looking at repression. So I think the lens of repression is really I think that all social movement scholars uh, uh, are are right jumping to this because it's something that is really really uh, is the other side of the movement thing about outside social movement. So and I think it's really really important topic to me and for many. Um, so one point, uh, I think that um, I would have many questions, many things that I'd like to discuss with you, but I remember uh, when I started studying repression, my, my, after I started studying, start, I started studying the repression under authoritarian regimes, uh, and uh, this was one of the big issues about, uh, in my PhD dissertation on the approach to uh, uh, student movements against the new state, and political freedom, etc. And after in my PhD, uh, postdoctoral project on uh, criminal political criminalization, the construction of political crime in a uh, in authoritarian regime. And then my, but my first, my big question has always been in this respect: what, which, which uh, can we use political violence or repression as an indication of the political regime? This uh, was always my question. I remember many conversations and discussions with Diego about this because if we count the numbers, if we just stay in the numbers, as you mentioned before, people dying in demonstrations, people dying in uh, uh, political in, in prisons, even in prisons, we have police much higher, higher numbers in, Italy, in the democratic Italy than in the uh, authoritarian uh, in the state. Uh, but of course, we don't have all this, or we have, but there are still less uh, uh, preventive.
preventive repression, what you only mentioned, all the, the preventative strategies of the uh, for repressive preventive strategies. So this comparison between regimes, I know that can be very banal and can, can be banalized or not. So we have political violence, we have strong repression, we don't have democracy, etc. But uh, so it can be very banalized the discourse about political violence and democracy. But on the other side, I think that it's not used as an indicator of the quality of democracy. And this is quite surprising to me. Uh, in the, you know the, the description and the definition of democracy, we don't have the, the, the element of, of repression, the quality of bodies, um, et cetera, et cetera. This is for me uh, how we can discuss these things and uh, to what extent we can use this uh, element for for understanding the uh, the quality of democracy or of the to distinguish the political regimes. Uh, the other points are a little bit more concrete. Um, as you mentioned that, uh, and I think it's very important that uh, Spain has uh, made degrees. Uh, they, they are countries that have very high level of political violence at the unfortunate moment, although Italy maybe recently much less after Genoa. I think that things get uh, got a bit better, uh, also because of uh, how to reform police. Uh, this was also happened after the 70s, the cycle process of the, the long system to very high level of political violence. In Italy, okay, we cannot answer the chain in this, but it was very, very high. And uh, there was a how to reflection by the police, inside the police, to innovate themselves. But what uh, my idea is, uh, okay, in, in respect to Portugal, uh, you don't think that uh, maybe it's more important than the type of transition uh, and the way also the following political system uh, uh, use political violence because sometimes legacies are a kind of justification. However, uh, we had a fascist regime, so now we are violent because we are fascist. But uh, the contemporary authorities have the responsibility. Sometimes they just use the negative justification for what they do in the daily life, in the, their contemporaneity. And this happened a lot, but if I take it a lot of time, but it's a very important thing for me. Uh, like the, the, you mentioned that the, 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 the penal code, for instance, that in Italy we still have the same penal code that uh, was uh, written during, during the fascism. Uh, it's the Codice Codic Rocco. The Codice of Penale Rocco that was written, okay, with reforms, etc. We have the same uh, policy law, test only for the public and secret, it's the same. Um, so there wasn't a willing of changing these things, and the willing is in the present, it's not. Uh, so I think that these things, uh, um, I don't know, I, I know better the political case in Spanish and in Greece, but uh, it looked look to me that a bit of. Uh, are willing to maintain this, uh, not just the legacy that is structural, etc. There is a kind of uh, uh, and after just to quick question to be uh, to be short, our, uh, yeah, uh, about the political the penal code uh, is is uh, when was it was is post democracy the penal the penal, it was written after the transition. Okay, this is very interesting. And uh, the second point, the final point was a little bit the point that also Martin mentioned that, uh, about the local, uh, the national, the, well, the independent, the, the regional uh, and, um, and national uh, policies. Like the, I, I always use this image when I teach policy projects in my classes of Jim Moss at Guad against Guadalupe Civil after the Catalan referendum with the Moss of the Squad defending. Uh, civilians again the Guardia Civil. And it's a very interesting moment for me about the, the, the contradictions of police in itself. And this also, I also always show the demonstration by police. In, in Portugal, police were very, this was very affected by austerity also. Uh, so they, they themselves had the big demonstration in front of the parliament. Also, with other police, uh, try to defend the parliament. So this uh, internal contradictions, let's say, in the public force. Sorry for there were many questions, but it's just it was a really, really lengthy presentation and touch many points. I'm really reflecting. Thanks so much, Guglielm. And they are all very 
uh, they, they give actually meaning to the presentation and they elevate my arguments to, to a better level. So I, I really appreciate uh, the way you are, you are approaching the questioning. Uh, it was quite, I, I hadn't thought about that, but while you, in relation to the first question, and why is it that these issues of violence against protesters and, and the hostility against the cycle of protests do not factor in when we evaluate the qualities of democracy. That is quite interesting because uh, there is this effort going on in Spain uh, for quite a, almost seven or eight years ago already. And, and there is this big think tank doing the Informe de la Calidad de la Democracia in España, es Fundación de Alternativas, and they are applying this uh, democratic audit coming from the United Kingdom, and they are approaching the same methodology. And it's funny because they've never done anything like that. So whenever they assess and they are trying, and then they give us a score of the quality of democracy, whether or not it's going up and down. And it's true that these kinds of, uh, whether or not there are violations violent incidents or whether there are facilitations of protest or no, whether this is not included. It's really not included. So there is no, perhaps not even an scholarly understanding that this, this might affect our, our assessment of whether or not we live and perhaps uh, because, well, uh, the ideas of activists do not navigate well and we do not take them as seriously, but it's true that it's not part of our thinking about whether or not we live in a better or a worse democracy, and perhaps it's, it should be. It's a very, very interesting idea. And, and I also really like your thinking about the transitions and the transformation of the police and whether or not they are an excuse. In the case of the, uh, Spain, and perhaps you are very right, the question is not the model of democracy, the transition towards democracy that we had. But what I am quite sure about that is that terrorism gave an excuse to the Spanish police not to do anything about themselves internally. So uh, and regardless of the model of transition that we had in the country, the big powers of the state at least knew that they had to do something about their own traditions, particularly the judiciary, for instance. No, They knew that they have to change their ways or they have to, to at least open up to new, more democratic ways. And in the case of the judiciary, they, they, they joined the European Union, forced so many judges well, to train differently. To well. However, a terrorism shield the police for any process of internal auditing or internal reform. And uh, all these bad habits coming from the part past endured because they were needed as a response to Basque terrorism in the, in the 80s. Unfortunately, once uh, Basque terrorism finished, we were already in a new era internationally in relation to penal uh, populism and this approach of dealing with social uh, uh, injustice through security and punishment. So it's as if we've missed the opportunity. We should have reformed our police perhaps in the late 80s and the 90s, perhaps we should have tried to build this idea for community police, but we didn't have the chance because we thought that we have to remain operational uh, against an internal threat and now that we don't have the internal threat, we do not seem to live in this environment in which the police can change from violent to cooperation. I, 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 I can't see that and, and, and because this connects with my own experience as a teacher in Salamanca, because we did, uh, we, in, in Salamanca, we train the Spanish policemen. We give them the official degree. I mean, the school of the police uh, in Spain is linked to the University of Salamanca. So the University of Salamanca uh, designs the training at the undergraduate and postgraduate levels of the policemen. So La Escuela de Policía is now an official university center. And uh, the, the education of these guys has nothing to do still with the social sciences. So the Still, they are taught about operational strategies, human resources, and the law. And it's funny, so it seems that we've missed really the chance to create a new type of, of police. And, and, and this, this is a large problem, obviously. Uh, we would need a lot of time to engage with it. But then there is a lot of discussion of infiltration of the far right into the Spanish riot policing, and whether or not box supporters and radical conservative supporters are becoming not just policemen, but they are inclined to be part of these bodies of the police that are involved in riots, etc. So, but, but uh, in short, I think we've missed in Spain the opportunity really to. Yeah, it's, it's, at least it has been the excuse. 
I don't know whether actually the, the, perhaps the police could have actually transformed, but it helped those uh, working from previous habits just to remain in place and to do their old ways. This is this is this would be my 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 answer uh, to that. Uh, very interesting, the, the Catalonian case. And um, Martin, when he presented the question, he talked at the same time of the Basque country and Catalonia, but they are not comparable countries. What is going on in Catalonia is communication 2.0. Policy is so linked with a political statement. All this that I support the Mossos de Squadra, but I do not support the Guardia Civil or the Guardia Civil facing difficult relationships with the regional police. This didn't happen in the Basque country. Because the Basque country, uh, uh, the Basque police was not really involved with terrorism. And also because ETA, the, the terrorist organization in the Basque country, targeted both bodies of police. So they were members of the regional police who were killed by ETA. Not as many, but it was not shielded. So we didn't see this kind of triangular games in which the, the, the Basque government was using the regional police to support them and then sort of remove them from demonstrations. So all these things that we are seeing in Catalonia, which is a communication political spectacle. So everybody is using security to advance their own political interests. This is something that is linked to the 21st century, you know, to the era that every single political movement is scrutinized online as seems to have a political Percussion. But this didn't really happen in the Basque, in the Basque country. There were different times. Well, actually, most of us we didn't have even internet. So these these games didn't really took place in the Basque country at the time. So this is very much a Catalonian, a Catalonian thing. And actually, it's very much a it has to do with the personality of the previous uh, president of the regional government. The fact that he came from the grassroots. So perhaps with a different type of premier, uh, perhaps we wouldn't have had this kind of conflicts. But the fact that his kids uh, were involved in the Los Comité Re the, uh, Re the Revolucionarios and that he actually was so close with the grassroots put him in a very difficult position in relation to, to protest, to protest uh, uh, politics. So, yeah. Okay. I don't know if Aitor has any questions. <laughs> I don't think he would have. I think he's the co-author. <laughs> um, so if not, I would, I'll close the session. Um, yeah, I always talk with Kermit, but anyway, I was thinking, I was listening to you. I was listening to you and um, I'm thinking about the Portuguese case. And this is a case and, where official repression, so to say, it, it was not so clear during the anti-austerity protest. There were some, and I think we should explore those more if we had if we had more people doing research on the topic and we all had more time to do that. But I was thinking about if there is some kind of intra-movement repression. Is there something like that in Spain? Because in Portugal, it's quite clear that sometimes trade unions are a bit, um, they don't repress, but they don't like to have the social movement, at least at the beginning of the cycle. They didn't like to have the movements around. That changed a bit at later stages, but there were even physical confrontations between trade unions and social movements. So I was thinking if if you can find something like that in, in, in Spain. That's a very, very interesting point, actually, connects very strongly with your own, with your own book. And, and, and I think the particular feature of, of Spain is that all these things happened in the absence of trade unions. No? So perhaps this is the big difference between mm. Spain and Portugal. If the austerity, at least at the beginning, um, or the Quince move, movement had been more closely connected with trade unions, perhaps the phase of mobilization and the responses by the authorities would have been perhaps very different. Um, Movimento Quinceme was so inspiring, so transformative, but perceived as so dangerous because it didn't have any institutional connections. Mm. And so I do not perceive that, that kind of inter-movement inter repression. Perhaps there is, but I haven't seen it. Uh, officially, trade unions have been very supportive, but have always looked uh, at the Quinceme from, from the sideways, no? Yeah. So they've been now colonizing uh, later expressions in the forums so, of the Mareas. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, for instance, the, the CGTP, the main trade union, when they organize a, a, a protest, they have their own security body mm -hmm. trying to like make the their march, their demonstration, as quiet as possible. It's like a, a proper performance because they don't want to, um, you know, create a mess in the street. That's not their point. They're making a political statement. So whenever they see something that goes out of line, they take care of the, the business. Uh, take care of business, not the police. But they 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 are they are doing they are playing the game of the state somehow. So um, th th this is what I thought in relation to 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 her question. I, I think that the future is going to be like that. So the, the thing of the the Movimiento Quinceme is that actually uh, were didn't have any any restrictions in the form of protest organization, leaders, so, and political authorities couldn't really handle a form of mobilization that was so different from the past, and perhaps because of the weakness of our own trade unions. So perhaps the future will be again, uh, the trade unions coming back and organizing all forms of mobilizations in the field of social justice, and then the state will be very happy because they will be controlled, there will be no plea for horizontal democracy, you will have leaders and organizations and representatives sitting with the Ministry of Labor. And, uh, but this was not the case, you very well know that, mm. the, the, for different reasons, because our trade unions were so weak, uh, for different reasons, the whole thing happened outside the control of trade unions, and this is why it, they became so inspiring, but also a target for repression. Now, I think this basically, and I really do not want to sound as a conspiracy theory, but the system really reacted, has reacted to something that is very challenging. Mm -hmm. So all these uh, elements are in, uh, activating the reform in the independent legislation. The penal code in Spain has been revised several times. So we have a huge reform in, two, in 1995, it was called the Código Penal de la Democracia, and then it has been heavily uh, 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 reformed in 2015. But in all cases, we are all in the direction of the United States. All the reforms are basically saying the same technique by which new behaviors are included in the, in the code, and those behaviors that were included in, this, in the code are subject to longer periods of sentencing. And the, the more we have revisions of the penal code, the judges had less room for not opting for, for imprisonment, which is the American drama, it is the Spanish drama. No, it's not uh, students of law learn that there are alternatives to, to, to the cartel, no? but actually Spanish judges do not really have so many alternatives because the penal code is saying it very clearly that to a larger number of behaviors, the punishment has to be imprisonment not all non alternatives to, to, to imprisonment. So this is why we have so very many people uh, uh, in jail uh, uh, nowadays in the, in the country. Very well. You want to say some closing words since it's the last session of the year? Well, uh, huh? no, I think uh, this is the last session of, of this year. And, and for me, it was, a pleasure for you to invite me to, um, first of all, to uh, help organizing the sessions. I think we had an amazing year with amazing speakers and we finished very well with, with German. It's uh, uh, in, in a hybrid session that we hope that uh, will be somehow what we will try to implement next year. But I think, I think I, I don't know if you agree, Guia, but I think it was pretty much a success this year in terms of the speakers that we brought. Uh, we brought people from all over the world speaking about all different, to very different topics. And, and we hope to continue this path ne next year and that we can constitute this seminar as, um, as, a community where we can build more social movement studies because the the seminar is not only for, I, I presented twice while still a PhD student so it's also for the PhD students is for the the growth of the social movement scholars to community to grow uh, and also I think it, it's I hope it's becoming an international reference to our colleagues outside of the country. Um, and we hope that next year we can do more and better and always with the, the same degree of um, the same degree of openness to everyone. And now 
close to you. And thank you very much, Carmen. My pleasure. It has been my pleasure. <laughs> And see you next year. <laughs>